changes everywhere. Would you like to be better at creating change and getting the results you want? If so, you're in the right place. Welcome to the next episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference both professionally and personally. This episode is brought to you by the Future of Work newsletter. Every week, you'll get articles, resources, and tools that will help you, your team, and your organization be more successful in the ever-changing remote and hybrid work environment. Learn more and sign up at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash F-O-W. And now, here's your host, Kevin. As a leading expert in the field, Brendan Baker is the author of the bestseller, Valuable Change, and has consulted on over $10 billion in key transformation projects and programs across a wide range of industries and organizational sizes. He established the Valuable Change Company with one central mission in mind, to help change leaders drive real value, but on his way, found his secondary mission to fight unnecessary complexity, where change isn't about delivering on time or on budget, but actually getting the results you're looking for from it. Brendan is based on the outskirts of rural Canterbury, Australia, has a degree in business management, and is the father of two young girls, so he's likely running on coffee for this call. Welcome, Brendan. Thank you. Well, glad to be here. Um, Well, well, let's just dive right in, and I really would like to know you know, you, when you were four years old, you didn't say, I want to be an organizational change expert. Uh, something happened. Something got you there. Tell us a little bit about the journey that leads you to the work that you're doing now. Uh, absolutely. It's it's funny. When I was four, you're absolutely right. Um, I I didn't want to, I didn't know what, uh, you know, change leadership <laughs> was. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's funny, actually, um, when I was eight, if you'd asked me what I want to be when I grow up, uh, the answer I would have given you is entrepreneur. Uh, which was the uh, the combination of low, growing up in a low socioeconomic area of Sydney is, alongside being handed a, a copy of Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, the combination of those meant I would walk around saying, I want to be an entrepreneur. I couldn't pronounce the word, but that nevertheless, that was the answer. Listen, I can't spell it, and I am one. But, uh... <laughs> uh, but, but look, coming back to you know the, the journey there, um, ultimately, my career has been driven by two key values. The first is that I knew that anything I wanted to do, I needed to make a positive change in people's lives. I needed to make a difference. Uh, and, and the second value is that I thrive on diversity and variety. And so anything that I did needed to have high levels of different contexts, different environments, and different challenges. Those were the guiding principles. Um, I then had a third realization about mid-teens, uh, where basically I came from a home where my dad had a trade and my mum was a teacher. Uh, and so my realization was I knew nothing about business. I knew nothing about how organizations work. I knew nothing about any of that arena. And you weren't and hearing so, about it at the dinner table. So I, no, it just wasn't at home. It wasn't at home. It's exactly right. So I went off and got myself a business degree and uh, figured I had to start somewhere uh, and started with project management uh, because I liked the idea of something that had a defined start and end. Uh, and that way it would build in that variety and that diversity. Uh, but uh, the less I say is, you know, a little bit, a little bit of history, but you know, the projects, uh, got bigger and, and more risky, uh, and, and more reputationally significant, um, and earn my, both my stripes and my scars, uh, through that process wore almost every hat in that, in that, in that arena that I possibly could. And then I had a realization I was sitting there one day, uh, and I was working on a government project and I was sitting alongside a, um, a consultant and I looked at his work, looked at my work looked at his work, and I realized that the work he was doing better fit my value set and and, and would enable me to better and uh, better serve a, a broader range of people and, and enable me to you know expose myself to more diversity and more challenge and, and more variety. And so made the pivot across into consulting. Uh, and that was when I started to see the patterns in the change leadership world. And that's what drew me there. Perfect. So you've been doing this starting in projects, which of course is all about change uh, and and continuing to do that in a variety of ways. And so uh, one of the things that I found as I read your book is that there's a lot of things that we agree on. 
And one of those is that uh, as a general statement, organizations aren't very good at making change happen. So why is it? I picked I picked safer language than my grandmother would have liked here. But why is it that change so many change efforts fail? That's it's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, and and look, there's multiple to research, and everyone likes to claim their own. You know, they're failing because of this and failing from that. Uh, but but ultimately, uh, what I saw is that it's it's failing due to change leaders finding themselves uh, stuck. But I felt I found that the the change industry has really pushed change leaders against a wall um, because the change industry at the moment has, has created all of these roles to create to to solve change problems. And, and to get, I'll give you some examples here. You've got project managers, you've got stakeholder managers, you've got change managers, you've got benefits managers. And, and there are all of these roles are deep in complexity, but very narrow in focus. But no one is helping the ch change leaders. Nobody's helping them. And so they're stuck. They're, they're ultimately stuck. And they've got Two, they've essentially got two options in front of them. They can either A, they, they can get very, very deep in the complexity across all of the roles and become the expert of the experts, which frankly, they don't have time to do. And so that basically change leaders always end up choosing option B, which is they cherry pick what they're comfortable with and what they're used to and ignore all the rest. And what they're used to is, is governing through really two questions. How long is this going to take and what's it going to cost me? Yeah. Yeah. How long and how much, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so you're saying that at the end of the day, it's it's the wrong guiding questions, right? Absolutely, yes. And, and so in the book, you talk about uh, three the right three questions to start with that that we should start with questions. And what you're saying is that too often change, change leaders are are defaulting to those two questions. But uh, mm -hmm. let, let's talk about what the right questions are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the right, the right questions, and I call these the, the three valuable questions. The right questions are, uh, why are we doing this? Borrowing a little bit from, from Simon Sinek, you know, start with why, but, but really there is this, this, um, this magic that happens when, when you start with why, and, and that's exactly where we should be, should be starting because how can you expect to define what success is or even know what, the, what, what to do if you don't know why you're doing it? So you start with why are we doing this? You then progress to the what I call the proof, which is really very much what does success look like in this arena and, and what does success look like to, to meet that why? And then finally, you get to what exactly are we doing? And it's in the what that you get the, the breakdown of how much and who and, and when and all of those elements. That There are elements of the what, but they're absolutely not the guiding principles here. So of the three, which is the one... Well, you just answered this in part when you said that people to end up going to the what exactly are we doing? But which of the three do we ask the least? In other words, which is the one that's maybe the biggest lever for change in our change efforts because people aren't asking it at all? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and to be honest, it's probably it's probably question two. Uh, you may have been expecting me to say, you know, it, it's, it's the why, but um, so often the why will get a cursory look at the very beginning. It'll be, oh, hang on, you know, we've got a problem. We roughly know what the problem is. Oh, let's, let's run to a solution. Uh, but, but no one's looking at, well, what does success look like and how do we plan to prove that? And, and what's interesting is that each of these three questions, uh, they're not just things that you do at the beginning of your, of, of your change. They, each of them translate into an ongoing discussion and ongoing decision because they essentially become metrics that you use to to guide yourself against uh, so the why are we doing this becomes is the why still valid when we're how, when, when you're progressing through the change the the what does success look like and how do we prove that translates into what are the early indicators starting to say are we still on track are we likely to achieve the future state we're after and then finally the what exactly are we doing that translates into are we progressing as we expect so I'm thinking people don't think uh, what I'm about to ask isn't usually thought of in terms of change, but is always thought of in terms of projects. And, and I think there may be a connection between those questions and this problem uh, or this situation. The situation is scope creep, right? Mm -hmm. We start with a project and it keeps doing, it keeps getting bigger. It keeps getting wider. It keeps getting broader. Uh, 
why does scope creep happen? And how do these questions keep, help us from letting it happen? Awesome question. Awesome question. Love it. Um, so scope creep, uh, which, you know, if, for those, I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners will know, but just in case they don't, scope creep is where you, th you, you start in and you have an idea of what you're doing and suddenly you're doing twice as much as you intended to when you're halfway down the road. Uh, well, as it, long just... as we're here, <laughs> right? As long as we're here, we yes. might as well. Well, it's right we, here. We let's well. just add this in. Right. That's right. You know, building a car. Well, let's just put the best tires on. Let's just put the best headlights, on, you know, whatever the, the metaphor is. Um, no, absolutely right. But coming back to it, how, what, how do these questions prevent scope creep and, and why does scope creep keep happening? Uh, look, there are a number of factors for scope creep, um, but it really comes back to change leadership. And, and it really comes around, comes back to having a nice, clear, strong change core. And this is one of the three ripple elements that I'm probably going to talk about um, throughout this discussion. But it all starts with your change core. And those three questions are really that fundamental uh, spine, change spine, uh, which is your change, change core. And you answer those three questions well, and they all link together quite nicely. And what that enables you to do is see the elements that don't fit, that don't answer that why, and you can strip them out. Now, there is, there is a complexifying factor and i don't know if that's a word but i'm going to use it anyway uh there is a complicating factor there in that what, uh, what i call the the ego component and it's something that we all need to be very very careful of as change leaders where uh it's this almost conscious idea of uh yes i know that we probably don't need to do this but i want it done so we're going to do it anyway and that that's another real risk when it comes to, to scope creep. In fact, there's a couple of, uh, a couple of interesting examples here. Um, a, a, an Australian-based um, superannuation company. So super is um, essentially our compulsory retirement fund that <laughs> employers pay in, into, mm -hmm. you know, into that. I, I think yours is the 401k uh, or something similar to that. So ours is superannuation. A, an Australian-based superannuation fund uh, was a new upcoming startup. It was pitching at the... Um, it was essentially pitching at the, the younger workforce uh, and saying, you know, we'll put your money where the world is going. Uh, and it was, it was had a heavy tech uh, and, and green yep. energy focus. Uh, and what was interesting, though, is uh, they never actually made the bridge across into becoming an independent super fund. Uh, and, and that's because they were denied their license because their founder had too much control over the funds. His ego was too strong and he... he um, he essentially wouldn't relinquish control and wouldn't build in the processes and whatnot that he needed to to relinquish that control. That control, and that there is proof of the of the ego component gone wild, because ultimately he defeated his own vision because he his ego got in the way. Right, he couldn't let go enough to do that. Exactly right. Yes. So, uh, I, I as we're as we're talking about. Uh, organizational large scale change, and we've already said, hey, they don't always work. Lots of research that says big percentage of them don't make, don't even answer those initial questions, like how long and how much. They take longer and cost more, so we don't even do yes. a good job of answering those questions that everyone Correct. wants to focus on. Uh, so, how is your approach different, Brendan? Uh, uh, like, and I, and I don't just want to frame this as Brendan's approach, but as like what should what should we all be doing differently? Absolutely. So, um, look, valuable change, and, and the reason why I wrote it, um, it, it's really centered on giving change leaders uh, what what they've otherwise haven't been given by the industry. Uh, so, I mentioned earlier around the, the industry is it's kind of abandoned them. And, uh, you know that there are textbooks for project managers, several textbooks. There are you know industry, there, there are global practices. Um, for, for change managers and benefits managers and their certifications, uh, you know, every, left, right and centre. But when it comes to change leaders, they're kind of left to fend for themselves. It's like, oh, you're the, you're the leader, you'll figure it out. Um, and but really what a change leader needs to be able to do is, is think holistically and, and, and think beyond the boundaries of the defined segregation within the, the standard industry roles because a change leader needs to sit abroad them. And if the change is big enough, sure, hire in those people to go to go deep and narrow. But but ultimately, a change leader needs to be focusing on three what I call the ripple areas. 
Um, and and I'll, I'll take a moment before I delve into them and explain why I call them the ripple areas, because ultimately a successful change ripples out. So I'll, I'll ask you this very quickly, Kevin. Um, where was the last time you went and ate out somewhere? Last night, actually. Oh, lovely. Where, where did you go? Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, at uh, I'm at the area of my farm, so I went to a to a restaurant in town that I've been to many times in my life. Beautiful. Now, let me ask you this: if if you were at that restaurant and a, a server came up to you and was rude, sarcastic, uh, rolled their eyes, and 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 all of that, I guess, negative social behavior, anti-social behavior, okay. um, how, what experience would have would that have given you um, for, for your night? How would that ex um, affected your night? Well, I, I'm probably not the normal person. I probably, I mean, I would, <laughs> very, I, well, the whole, everyone's watching, like, yeah, he's not normal. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I, I think the answer for most people would be it would like really ruin their evening for me. I'd be like, well, that was interesting. I didn't really like that. And then I wouldn't think mm. much about it for very yes. long. But the reality is it definitely would change my yes. experience of dinner. And hopefully I'm going to let go of it at that moment. But yes, it still yes. makes a huge change. It, it does. Absolutely. And, and what's interesting is that that's, that come, kind of comes down to the way that we humans interact with, with each other. That there is this ripple effect that occurs from one human across to the other. And, yes. and, and it's absolutely the same with change because what, in, in this imaginary scenario which we've created, it's entirely plausible that perhaps that server turned up to work happy that day. Uh, but, but the restaurant manager, they were having the bad day and they took it out on everyone in front of them. And so, uh, and so the service took the brunt of it and then they're taking it out on the customers and it ripples through. Um, the same happens in change. The same happens in our changes. And so what this is this is something I've discovered because you, you asked me earlier why a change fails and, and I talked about change leadership um, because ultimately a change leader is responsible for each of the three ripple areas uh, th throughout a change. That they, they are responsible for making sure that their change has a strong, clear change core, which is those three questions that, that, we, that we've already discussed right. and answering them effectively and, and translating them effectively. And then beyond that, that that's, that's your core. That's kind of throwing the stone into, into, into the pond. Then it ripples out. And, and the next ripple out and the second ripple area is uh, what I call the, the high momentum change platform. But when I say platform, I'm not talking about a tech stack uh, or, or, or a cloud-based solution or anything tech. I'm talking people, processes, and culture. I'm talking, is your, is your change, are your change teams learning? Are they progressing? Are they continually getting better? Uh, and have you built them to the point where they would stand at the top of the building and say, this change is different, this change is awesome, and you should be part of it? And, and, and have you generated that level of fanaticism? Because ultimately, that's, that's part of the, the change leaders remit. And, and that's your second ripple. And once you build up that high momentum, then it ripples out into your third level. Uh, your third ripple layer, which which is outside of your change, which is the broader organization or, or your key stakeholder groups, uh, and it's that area that you then that that a, you as a change leader need to be able to um, have the right levers in play and best utilize uh, the, the people in that space and, and work efficiently. Um, and, and we'll probably touch on a little bit later, but um, you know how do we find the key influences? Within, within our organizations. And, and there's some interesting science as, as to how we do that and how do we best bring people together and how do we create those connections that we can ultimately leverage? And that's the ripple through. Uh, and, and unfortunately, none of these are, are a one and done thing. Build a change core and then move on to your team. And that they once you've got all three you know, plates in there, you've got to keep them spinning. Uh, but the ripple that, keeps that really going, is right. that focus. Exactly right. The ripple keeps going. So you're, so you're, approach is different because it thinks about this. I, I mean, you've said this like three times now, Brendan, which is this idea that it's not just start, get it started right. It's that you're continuing to, my words now, monitor and nurture these components as you go in terms of the answers to your three valuable questions, in terms of how that, how that ripples out into the ripples and how we manage those, et cetera. You said something a second ago uh, about what we're trying to create as a change leader. Uh, this is not in my, this is not in my questions, but it's too good to not ask. So, um, <laughs> so my question is this, um, you used a word, you used the word fanaticism, I'm pretty confident that you used it on purpose. Um, 
Is that what we're trying to create as change leaders? Our fanatics, zealots, yes. evangelists? Yes. And, and it's funny you say the word evangelist because my, uh, basically, I, I have a, in the book, I've got a, a momentum model. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if you saw that, um, but essentially, um, when we're looking at that second ripple, when we're looking at our, our teams within our change, um, and, and mind you, that there is a reason why uh, we need to be looking at the building momentum for our change for our change teams and our change effort. Because I've seen a number of, and I'm talking very high profile, hundreds of millions of dollars of change. I've seen a number of those fall over because the teams themselves burn out. And you see extremely high turnover. You see uh, very expensive contractors, consultants rolling in, rolling out, um, because the the environment is is it's not that it's high momentum. It's it's low momentum, uh, and it burns people out because they keep hitting roadblocks. And so, as a change leader, is absolutely our responsibility to to build that high momentum. And and really, when you're thinking about momentum, you need to be thinking in terms of two key factors, and it's hope and energy. Now, hope is hope is really almost an, an optimism for the future. It's it's a it's a willingness to keep moving forward because you think the future is and is important and what you're doing is important. Uh, while energy is closer to uh, I guess how you would describe a four year old. I've got a four year old, um, and and how you would describe a four year old bouncing off the furniture and, and and whatnot. I mean, we're not expecting our change team to bounce off the furniture. Well, well, you know, hopefully not. Um, but not every day. day. Not every. Well, day. they're not every day. Exactly right. Uh, but but either way, it, it's still that, that that energy that you can feel. It's almost tangible. And so, what we're th- when we're thinking about these things, when we're thinking about momentum through hope and energy, uh, really, there's five stages that that a team could be at at any one stage at any one time. Uh, your, your bottom stage, you've got low hope, low energy. That's a team in despair. Uh, and and we've probably all seen them. We've probably all experienced them uh, and may well have been in them ourselves uh, in, in previous lives or previous places. Um, and so that's, it's not a nice place to be. And that tends to be teams that are stuck uh, because if they, if they weren't stuck, they probably wouldn't be there. No one likes being in despair. No one likes turning up to work each day uh, and, and not wanting to be there. Yep. And, uh, and so, so, you know, so, that's your bottom level. And, and to get out of despair, you need to be building hope more than anything because you can't build energy from that point. You need to reintroduce some, some optimism. Uh, and, and I mean, there's a number of strategies to do that and I'm not going to delve too deep into them. Uh, but overall, you basically need to provide an excuse. You need to give them a little inkling of hope. And then, then they will progress up into um, fearful, uh, which, which is the next stage up. Now, fearful is interesting uh, because... Fearful doesn't look that different to despair, and it, it can be difficult to tell the difference. The difference comes down to the amount of hope. Uh, and a team in fearful is is still very hesitant to take risks. Is still likely complaining about majority things uh, to to hide their um to, to essentially hide uh, you know their fears. No one likes admitting yeah. that, that we're scared. Uh, and, but you know, from fearful, you can essentially you can eventually build them up to um, hopeful. Once again, building hope. And it's that hopeful that you could then start to pivot your efforts and, and you you then start to focus on energy. And, and then we shift them up to motivated and eventually up to fanatic. And, and, and your question at the beginning was, is that what we're after? Are, are, we, are, we, are we trying to build fanatics, zealots, evangelists? Um, and, and I think we are. Because as a change, we're not, as, as a change leader, you're not driving every day. You're driving something new. You're driving something different. Uh, and, and ultimately, you, you need enough emotional capital on your side in order to overwhelm the pain of the change. So, so there's a concept I talk about in the book called the value equation. Uh, and, and when we think about change, we often think about the, you know, the what's in it for them or the what's in it for me uh, style thinking. Where, but ultimately, that's only one half of the equation. Uh, there's, there's a very interesting study that, that was done, um, which essentially looked at people's pain tolerance, where they, where they essentially zapped people. And they, they had two groups of, of students uh, in, a, in a university um, over there in, in the US, and they, they pulled them into, into, into two groups. 
the first group, which I call the, the poor souls, um, they were essentially pulled into a room, asked to do a series of, you know, letter and maths based tasks, you know, one plus one equals two. And every, every second time they got it right, they got an electric shock. Um, and then they said, thank you for your service and off you go. It was the second group, uh, which, you know, still a degree of poor souls, but at least they got rewarded for it. Essentially, these researchers introduced a, a reward factor to them. Uh, so er, for, for them. So every time that they uh, were zapped, uh, they would see a little running tally on the screen. Um, and, and, and the higher the tally, uh, the more they were paid at the end of their experiment. And so there was both a gamification element as well as a, um, a monetary reward element. And what, was, what, what the research found, and it's probably no surprise, uh, but the people who were being rewarded for being zapped voluntarily got zapped a, a dramatically more. Uh, and so, so that that really boils down to to what I call the value equation, which is which is your reward minus your pain equals your decision. And so, as as coming back to the original question, as change leaders, yes, we need to be building fanatics, and yes, we need to be doing something fundamentally different within our change. Because number one, we need we need others outside of our change to look in and say, wow, they're doing something very cool. They're doing something very different. Uh, and build that emotional, almost jealous capital, where they go, "Wow, I, I want to be part of that," right? Because that is how you you overcome that that emotional pain barrier. Perfect. Um, so, in the world that we live in today, uh, Brendan, you know, where leaders are often leading at a distance, or the team is all working remotely, or working in some hybrid scenario. I know that you and I are having this conversation a couple of months before that people are going to hear this. And then, you know, th it'll be time long after that, that people will listen. But but I think this question will remain important. And that is, what do we as change leaders need to know, or think about if we're doing this at a distance, not everyone's in the same place, whether it's the whole project team, or it's a far-flung change effort. What do we need to know to do this at a distance? Awesome question. Awesome question. Uh, and, and it's funny because uh, in the book, when I talk about measuring momentum, uh, one, of the key, uh, one of the key ways that, that I recommend uh, is walking around the team and gauging the energy. Uh, and, and it's difficult uh, in this, I guess, post-COVID world. Um, Teams are geolocated. Teams are spread. Teams are people people from working from home, and, and I know it's something that that you do a lot of work in, Kevin. Um, and and um, so as to coming back to how we do it, um, I mean we've all been working from home for for almost a couple of years now, uh, and in, in various ways in various sources. Um, and what I've noticed is that that gut feel. Uh, which I, I mean, there are ways to measure it and you can come up with arbitrary surveys and, and whatnot to try to measure the hope and the energy. But again, it comes down to gut feel and being in touch as, as a change leader. That gut feel is still palpable, even through technology. Yeah. Uh, and, and even on a phone call, even if you take away the entire body language and, and, and you only chat on the phone, you can still read people. Because we as humans have this innate ability to uh, to cooperate and collaborate because that, that's what's given us an evolutionary edge. And so that's built in and that enables us to, um, to really read and understand each other. And so I, I, my advice, whether you're geolocated uh, and diverse or whether you're all together in the same office is, is still the same. As a change leader, you need to have your finger on the pulse and you need to still make gut feel measurements against hope and energy. So, uh, so thanks for that. And I appreciate that. And I think you're right. Too many leaders have basically said, well, I can't figure this out. I can't know when I can't see my people when that don't, I don't think that has to be true. I think we just need to be more aware, more intent and pay attention more, slow down a little bit. And I think follow our gut. I think that's good, good advice. So I know that you like your work. I mean, it's a quarter to 6 a.m. Uh, and you and I are having this conversation and everyone can tell the energy and the passion you have for it. But Life is not just about work. So what do you do, Brendan, for fun? Uh, awesome question. Uh, so, and, and probably the most important we've talked about. Uh, I'm actually, I think I was listening to one of your earlier, uh, one of your early guests and they were talking about they had an enjoyment ratio of, of one or, or something, some, some quotient of, of one. Um, I'm probably on the other end of the scale. I'm driven by fun. I love fun. Uh, a common question I ask people is, uh, are you having fun? Uh, because, you know, it, even when it comes to work, uh, if you're not having fun at work, you probably need to have a think about shifting a few things. 
uh, and it's a key thing, you know, I'm almost coming back to here, momentum, uh, building fun and building gamification into it. But coming back to my personal life, look, I've got two young, um, I've, I've got two young girls. Uh, you said sons at the beginning at the intro, but uh, I've, I've got two young girls. I've got a four-year-old and an 18-month-old. Um, so I have to stop. Running... Your daughters are not oh. going to listen to this, but it does still <laughs> girls. If I misspoke, I apologize. <laughs> Father of two young girls. So sorry about yes. that. Daughter. No, that's fine. Yes. <laughs> um, so I've got, in fact, there's a running joke in my house that I'm heavily outnumbered uh, because I'm the only male. Uh, we've got, I've got a couple of dogs. I've got two daughters and I've got a beautiful wife. Uh, in fact, I do have some fish and my, I hold out hope that there might be a male in, in that fish tank. Um, but otherwise I am heavily It's outnumbered. not going to really matter. It's not going to change the <laughs> no. hormone balance. Oh, no, that's true. That's very true. But so but in all honesty, I spend a lot of my time with uh, playing with my girls and, and reading the books and, 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 and whatnot. Um, but I do carve out a little bit of time every fortnight. Uh, and and I'll, I'll be a self-professed nerd, and, and that's totally fine. Um, I really enjoy tabletop role-play gaming. So think Dungeons and Dragons style games. Uh, and and it, to be honest, it gets a fairly bad rap as, you know, these, uh, you know, played in a basement somewhere and, uh, you know, uh, with, with the mum upstairs and, you know, middle of the night, have never done anything. You didn't grow yes. up. <laughs> exactly right but but what's really interesting about tabletop gaming uh and you know i've got to be careful i don't i don't you know get too into it um is that it's essentially it's an opportunity to hang out with my friends um have a couple of drinks and uh basically engage in a collaborative storytelling experience and and get those creative muscles working uh and and i find that a lot of fun beautiful so I know that, like me, you're a reader, and I also know that you knew this question was coming because you, as you told me earlier, you did your homework and listened to, watched a couple of episodes. So you knew this question was coming, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, so what are you reading these days? What am I reading? Uh, so I'm currently reading a book called Sync uh, by Stephen Strogatz, and I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, I'm going to blame my accent on that one. Um, but but essentially, it's, it's how order... Uh, emerges in in the natural world from from chaos, uh, and as someone who's interested in uh, in, in change uh, and the chaotic world of organizations, I was going to say um, where, I, where we have chaos, and, and, yes. and often when we do things, uh, we don't do things the way that you've described. We end up with more of it. Um, exactly. So yeah, so the book is yes. sync. Is sync yes, uh, and, and I'll give you a, you know, a little example of the kind of thing that that, it, that he talks about in it. Um, so I think it's in Thailand, but it's definitely in Southeast Asia somewhere. Um, there's a, a group of fireflies um, that uh, if you if you take any one of these fireflies, it'll have its own internal rhythm, its own internal beat. It'll it'll essentially flash uh, on its own rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, but if if you go up to uh, a certain cliff face at a certain part of the year, you'll see uh, millions of these fireflies all throughout the, the coastline, all blinking in unison. Uh, and and what was interesting, if you take a single one out, it'll once again uh, it'll come back to its its original inbuilt natural rhythm, which will be different. You put it back near the group where it can uh, see it, and it'll sync back up. Uh, and and that's what the book is talking about this this natural ability to to sync within nature. Um, and I find it fascinating. That's very fascinating, and. The first time anyone has recommended that book here. You know, excellent. Brandon, Kevin, your podcast is the most expensive one I listen to. I'm like, what are you talking about? Is this every week? I got to go buy a couple of books, a book from the guest if they, if they wrote a book, and then whatever they're recommending. So I really appreciate you sharing, especially yes. when it's something that maybe we haven't all heard of before. So that's really awesome. I appreciate that. So before we go, one more question for you. What can Where can people learn more about getting the copy of the book? Uh, and or about mm -hmm. your work and just the approach that you take, where can people go? What can they what can they do? Absolutely. Uh, look, um, valuablechange.com, nice and easy. Uh, and so, so that's where you'll find me. That's where you'll find my work. Uh, that said, um, the book uh, and, and getting the book across in, in, into your listings in the, into the US or, or worldwide, um, honestly, Amazon's probably one of the better places to go. Um, the audio book is currently in development and will be out um, within well by the end of the year is the current time frame as well so you'll be able to pick it up on audible or, uh, which or, Google means, Play or, or anywhere in that space yeah which means that by the time that anyone hears this besides you and me uh it will be available yes. in all those places so if you'd That's rather exactly listen right. so, so are, that, are, 
Go ahead. Um, so, so, uh, I, I, absolutely right. Um, so, so yes, valuablechange.com. Uh, otherwise, uh, pick up the audiobook any way you, you want to pick up your audiobook. Uh, pick up the paperback any way you want to pick up the back paperback. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm always on emails, uh, and I love receiving it from people. There you go. Uh, so now I have a question for all of you. The question that I ask every week, it's the question that the, it's the most important question of the day for you. And it's this, now what, what are you going to do as a result of this? What action will you take? Will, will you think about those three valuable questions to ask? Will you think about how you can manage and extend the ripples? Will you think about what it is that stops your change from being as effective as it could be? Where are you going to start? What action will you take as a result of being here? Because if you don't, then this wasn't much better than listening to, I don't know, some podcast. I don't know. What are the, what's a podcast? Oh, my daughter listens to these true crime. This is no better than true crime podcast, unless you take some action as a result. You don't want to take action on the true crime podcast, but you want to take action here. Uh, Brandon, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so everybody, today's episode was brought to you by uh, Remarkable master classes. Each month we release a new skill in an advanced form of master class designed to help you become the most remarkable leader and human, the one that you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or how to get discounts for each month can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. And with that, you know we'll be back next week and I hope you'll be back with us too for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks everybody.